Pearl, do you read me? Hi. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Are you doing the homeschool thing? Yeah, I mean we're we're uh, Los Angeles, uh, so everything it's all totally online. I, I guess some private schools were going in once a week or something, but we've always just been totally online. Yeah. Not always, but since since the lockdown and stuff. Yeah, and it's still pretty tight out there, isn't it? You know, it's a it's a vibe out here. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we were just on the East Coast for three months. Uh, we wound up getting this impromptu invite in August, one that we couldn't pass up. So we took it and we just extended it. And we were in uh, Connecticut and we were in Woodstock, New York. And the vibe there, I mean, it's the same stuff going on, but the vibe is way more mellow. And then you come back to L.A. and it's it's thicker. You know, the it's because it's pretty bad here right now, I think. So, yeah, we're just uh, staying home and homeschooling. And we have our little bubble of humans we that we see. We don't see anyone else. And so far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. We're kind of in the same boat. I think I think everybody's kind of doing that again. I, I remember Rebecca and I got out of the house like one time. And we actually got, I think, her mom to watch the kids. And we went to see Ward um, in Dallas. Oh, yeah. He told me about that. Yeah. And I just brought my guitar. I just crashed his stage. He was doing acoustic and I, I was jonesing to play anyway. So uh, I walk in this bar and it was kind of right when everybody was kind of starting to think like they just kind of quit doing COVID. And, you know, like my mom used to say, you know, that false sense of feeling good, you know, and uh, I walked in this bar and me and Rebecca were wearing masks and there wasn't a damn person in that that thing wearing a mask, you know, I thought, oh shit, I'm glad I'm sitting up on the stage <laughs> away from everybody. It was just, yeah. Yeah. And we got home and, um, Rebecca was like, you know, cause we're, she's, you know, you know her, she's a science lady. So, you know, she's, she's like, all right, I just, I'm, I'm going to be on pins and needles for the next week. One of us is going to get sick. I was like, well, oh shit. Let's hope not. But well, hey, it looks like everybody's there. Uh, Josh, loud and clear. Hey, uh, yeah, loud and clear. Hi, Pearl. Hi. It's good to see you again. Hey, man, how's it going? Going really well. I just switched my screen over. Now I can see everybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, we got Bobby Keith up in my left hand corner. Bobby Keith, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? It's good to see your faces. Bobby Key sounds great today because we found out after, I don't know. 25. 25 episodes, he wasn't using his microphone properly. <laughs> <laughs> I just had this thing in my face for no reason I had this thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't been picking up through the, the microphone. It just was like, like just there. It just made you look cool and stuff. Oh. Well, you it look makes you look really, you look professional. That's, that's what I try to go for. That's, that's all that matters. That's what he's, yeah. <laughs> but you sound right. great today, buddy. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks to oh, y'all. Man. Oh. All right. And uh, out of Nashville, Tennessee, we have turning the knobs, Seth knows, knows worthy. And uh, he's listening to us. He, he doesn't talk much. We got, uh, we got somebody, man, Pearl, you've just become, we have just become buddies. And, uh, our families have become friends and we've gotten to do some really cool things together. Uh, you know, family wise, Disneyland, and we'll go into that stuff. Uh, we met in a really cool setting. Um, but, uh, just one of, you're one of the most magical, uh, people I've ever met. Pearl, Pearl glows. And today she is our, she's our, our guest on a couple in with Cody Jinx. Uh, we have Pearl a day. She goes by Pearl when she's on stage and, uh, we've gotten to share the stage, uh, many times together and, uh, man, just thank you for being with us. I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I'm honored that you invited me. I was like, who me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks man. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know that, um, you know, we already kind of dove into what everybody's doing or what everybody's not doing. But, you know, the whole situation is uh, we, we play live 
and we can't play live right now. How's that? Uh, how's that hitting you? Well, I miss it. You know, I guess the one thing about this time is that people have the opportunity to get creative. You know, and I understand that it's very cool to do those remote performances, you know, whether you're doing it by yourself or you have your bandmates in their respective places and then you someone edits it all together and it sounds like you're all playing together. That is very cool. But that is also very much not the same thing as live music. There's nothing in the world that can replace live music. I mean, you know that. You all know that. Um, so that's still pretty heartbreaking, I think, to most people on the planet, I would say, performers and audience alike. So it's tough to not have, to not have that. And I hope it comes back <laughs> really soon. You know, there's also the financial part of it, which is a, a really big deal, but, um, it's just heartbreaking all around, but hopefully it's temporary. Hopefully it's coming back soon. Yeah, you know, we uh, like we were talking about a while ago. I haven't played since. Um, I mean, we we got off tour at the end of February this year, and we hadn't played since. But going to do that, and in in a lot of ways, the time off has been kind of good. Um, you know, for the reasons it's not good, but you know, a little bit of time off has been uh, has been good. A lot of time off's been kind of weird, but I, I went and did that thing with Ward. And it had been months since I'd been on stage and man, I, I played us. I don't remember what song I played first. We were just playing acoustic and there was like a hundred people there, you know, and uh, they were starved for it. And I got done with that first song and man, they just like started clapping and I just got this big shit eating grin on my face and Ward looks over and he goes, you miss it, don't you? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> man, I, like I, I miss it really bad. You know, it, it's um, you think you don't miss it that much. And, and then you start thinking about it and you get, bummed out you know yeah no because it's something that's irreplaceable i think it's it's there's a magic to it and the energy of having that privilege of being an artist and having an audience who wants you mm -hmm. and you get to share your music with people who want you and who want to hear it there's nothing like that in the world Nothing like that on in the universe. My dad always taught me, my dad's a performer too, and he taught me always first thing that you should know if you want to become a performer is that performing on a stage is a privilege. It's not a right. So it's a privilege. If you, it doesn't matter if you have one person or one million people there to see you, you give a thousand billion percent of your effort and your skills and your talents every single time doesn't matter what kind of venue you're playing in because you you wouldn't have a show if you didn't have an audience and that's magical you know these he all it's so funny because he always used to get so mad at these shitheads like shithead rock stars or whoever would show up keep their audience waiting two hours and show up late and you know all that kind of bullshit it it that is wrong <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. that's like that's really uh it's a privilege it's not your right to step on a stage you know and so hopefully maybe after this people will people who are feeling a little too high on their horses will feel like you know okay this is something that's really important it, it got taken away and now it's back and i'm going to make the most of it you know well, and you know, your dad ought to know, um, he's one of the best the business has ever seen. I, I still think he's one of the highest selling, uh, artists of all time. Right. Um, I think it was for a while. I, I don't know if, if it's been surpassed. I don't know. It, it was for a while. It was bad out of hell versus like the Eagles greatest hits or something for yeah. the biggest selling albums of all time. I think somebody might've surpassed that by now but um, um well <laughs> damn we're splitting hairs here buddy <laughs> you know <laughs> that's that's just crazy and and you know uh you know obviously your dad is your dad is me loaf and and uh there was one time it was funny because your dad's a texan your dad's a native texan right oh yeah and i remember i got this funky text from you one day 
and it wasn't you. It was, it was your dad. And he made some kind of, I can't even, I'm not even going to say what he said, but it was, it was funny. It was kind of making fun of me from be, for being from Fort Worth. Um, Cause I think he had the Dallas. I remember ties. what it was. Uh, I remember what it was. <laughs> he was actually, I would, he was in the hospital. He had just had back surgery and I went to visit him and I was sitting next to his bedside and he was asking me what I was doing and, and you came up and he, and he said, he's a Texan, ain't he? And I said, yeah. And he goes, give me his number. I said, dad, I'm not going to give you his number. You're nuts. And, uh, he goes, text him now. And I said, all right. So I texted you and I said, I think I said, somebody here wants to say hi or something like that. And then he got on, he was like, is this Cody? It said meet here. It said, Hey Cody, meet here. And I was thinking, <laughs> what the hell is she talking about? You know? <laughs> and, <I> was, yeah. <laughs> and it said something like, I'm from Dallas. I heard you're from Fort Worth. I'm sorry about that or something. Yeah. <laughs> it, was some, it was something colorful. Yeah. 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 Oh man. That, that was too cool. And then I was just, after it dawned on me, I was like, Holy shit, I just got a text from Meatloaf. You know, it's like, <laughs> so weird. I mean, you just, y'all are first name basis. Meat here. What's meat up, here? <laughs> everybody, people call him meat. Everybody calls him meat. My mom calls him meat. Everybody calls him meat. My, my, our son, my son, Revel calls him Papa Meat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I love it. Revel. That's great. That is too cool. Well, that kind of brings me into, uh, into music. One of the first songs that I heard you do, and I guess we could go back to when we met, because um, I heard, I think you did this song that night, and I'm talking about the song Rebel Young, and, and it's talking about your son Rebel, and that's one of my two favorite, and we'll get to my other favorite in a minute, but we met at W. Earl Brown's house in Los Angeles, and it was Ward Davis, New Earl, or knows Earl, and... Me and uh, Ward had done the Conan O'Brien show that night. We end, all end up at this dinner party, and it's you and your husband, Scott, Scott Ian from Anthrax, uh, W.L. Brown, better known probably to most people as Dan Doherty. He's been on the show, and, man, we just wound him up, and he turned into Steve Earl, dude. It was awesome. Earl can jump into the character and make you believe that it's that person in, like in a, immediately. He's an incredible actor. Oh, he's the best. And, uh, and we just ended up in the living room sitting there uh, playing guitars and singing songs and whatnot. And I'm pretty sure you sang Revel Young. That, that was really the one that, that jumped out. But whenever we were playing that night, Rebecca looks over and, and like, we just, I was like, damn, dude, you know. Um, so that leads into uh, Heartbreak and Canyon Revelry, uh, released 2018, right? Yeah. Awesome. Can we elaborate on that? What do you want to say? <laughs> You, you are correct. Okay. Um, no. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> I just, yeah. Talk about it a little bit, like how, because because it's a pretty far cry from uh, Little White Immaculate Fox. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, in between <laughs> Little Immaculate White Fox, um, which was my first album, and that was like hard rock. Um, yeah, it is. You know, we got and we got some really great traction on that album. It was. You know, I was opening for Heart and on the road with Velvet Revolver and we were musical guests on Jimmy Kimmel. You know, shit was happening, man. And, and you know, shit happens. Um, life changes. I had a, a baby. I had a son. And Scott and I had a, a son. And um, I don't know. These were just the so heartbreaking Canyon revelry was, the, was the next album after that. And these were just the songs that came out. It's funny. I wrote those songs on that album with Jim Wilson, the same person I wrote all the songs on the first album with. And the way we write is he'll send me melody idea, whether he's playing it in here and he's going, na, 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 you know, and he sends it to me on a voice text or whatever. And then I, usually plug in the words that's how i work i've always worked with him so he was sending me these song ideas and that this is what they were sounding like they were sounding more different than the first album so i don't know if it's just because we are so you know on the same wavelength we were feeling the same vibe for for this next album without even really talking about it but that's 
just kind of what came out. And I, I don't know. Certainly, it has you know more of maybe a country edge because call it because of pedal steel. I don't think that it's really country, but uh, you know, I, it all depends. I, it's not up to me to to label it. I guess I just I just am supposed to feel it. But um, that album took me, I think, like seven years to finish in between uh, bedtimes and bottles and mm-hmm. diaper changes, and we would get into the studio when we could and piece by piece and you know we had some cool guest stars on that album like we had on the first album uh it just took a lot longer (laughs) yeah i know but that's what happens sometimes you know Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm well and i I just i'll cite i'll cite that song one more time and I, i brought this up to you whenever uh we were on tour and and we were first kind of just having a a drink before a show or after show or whatever, and just kind of talk and shop. And I, you know, and, and, and I, I stood there and I watched you every night that you played. And, and that one line in that song, uh, I am not afraid. And you were talking about, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, that line, I'm not afraid. I said, you were, you were talking about becoming a, a parent and becoming a mother. And like, like I can do this because you got to go take a driving test and you got to go, take a test to get whatever permit and you got, when you have a kid, they just, here's your baby. And they send you on your way, you know, there you go. Don't (laughs) kill it. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, we, (laughs) we had a laugh about that. Cause I was like, I mean, this scares the hell out of everybody. Yeah. You know, I wasn't really afraid until he got there. It's a trip. It's, with I don't need no I don't need to say that but having a child is a trip. Nobody oh can gosh. prepare you for it. Nobody can tell you anything that's going to make you be ready. Oh, right? Absolutely. So it was funny because uh, I was talking to somebody a few months after Revel was born, and they had just had a baby as well, and and they said to me, "Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it? Isn't the world just so much more beautiful now?" And I and I said, "Yeah, it's wonderful, but." The world is so much more terrifying to me now. I, I would agree. I, the world got a whole lot uglier whenever my kids yeah. showed up. Yeah. Yeah. When it's when it when I have someone else to be completely and fully responsible for, except for myself. You know, I mean, I was running around in my tw- I did shit in my twenties. I don't know how I'm not maimed or dead. You know what I mean? So uh, when you have a child, it it changes how you think about things. You know. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Even movies, even movies that I watched before, I can't watch now because it freaks me out. Oh, I can't watch Pet Cemetery anymore. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Pet Cemetery, the yeah. truck in the thing. <laughs> no. Yeah, I I can't I can't watch that. I'll I'll crawl out of my skin. Hell no. I uh, know. You know one of our favorite movies before uh, Scott and I love that movie, The Road. Have you ever seen The Road? Oh, okay. I, that's one of my favorite books. I actually, I tell you what, I will send you a copy of. I have multiples of that book. You got to read the book. I got to read. I think Scott read the book because he's like an avid reader. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Um, I haven't read it yet. And I, Scott said, I think Scott said that the book is way more bleak than the movie. Of course, because yeah. Hollywood. But, well, um, you know, it's it's funny you bring that up too. Uh, Hack, our our tour manager, monitor guy, um, he he sent me a Christmas present and uh, and he sent me that book and I was like, because uh, I love dystopian <laughs> stuff and all that kind of stuff. So I'll I'm going to keep the copy that that he sent me and I'll send you my copy and then uh, yeah, you got you got to read that or unless awesome. Scott still got it, you know. But, um, I don't. Who knows? I, I, I'll read it. I don't know if I can handle it though. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's it's tough. It's apocalyptic. It's a, I mean, yeah. that's it. You know, I, I won't. I won't be a spoiler, but you know what happens anyway. It's um, gnarly. It's gnarly. I was just about to ask you a really stupid question. Well, fighting the mushroom over here. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I got it. All right. I tell you what. This is this is real funny. This is not real funny. But uh, you doing this while ago, Rebecca's. Uh, She's like, well, ago, we don't have water in our house right now. Our well, the pump that gets the water to the house went out and it started going out and it slowly went from like the water was on to a trickle to like, now there's nothing. So a while ago, Rebecca was in there going, I just want to wash my hair. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, she's going to listen to this and call me all kinds of bad words. Um, <laughs> now, this is also a cool story. Um, Gina's song. Yeah. Uh, all I Got. Yep. I've heard you share that story on stage. And that's one of those ones that when you're listening to it, you just, you're going, damn, that's badass. All right. Man, tell tell it. It's a great story. If, if you can, if you're at liberty. No, I'll, I'll, yeah, no. It, that song is about a girl that Scott and I met, a mutual friend through a mutual fr- our friend Lon Friend. His name is Lon Friend. He's our friend, and we we were in Vegas a thousand chapters ago, and um, we came down to the lobby of our hotel to meet him for a drink before going out that night, and he had a friend with him, and her name is Gina. We just hit it off. She was very young, much younger, not illegally young, but she was, you know, 20 maybe at the time when we met. And um, there was just something about her. I could tell she was an old soul. She had a lot in her eyes. Gorgeous, gorgeous, perfectly like a, like a Barbie doll, but, but, but sweet, you know, and she was a dancer. And we just immediately hit it off. I was just interested in her. She was really smart, really engaging, really interesting. And we kept up this friendship for years. And, you know, I learned that she was a runaway. She ran away from a, an abusive home, uh, wound up in Vegas, wound up dancing at the Spearmint Rhino or something like that. But she had a really good head on her shoulders and she had a lot of trauma behind her that wasn't destroying her it was making her fierce and smarter and she was just a warrior and she told me she wanted to be a writer she was an artist and she was a writer so i found that really inspiring apparently and i wrote this song about her gina's song and i lost track of her for a while and she would pop up on social media and I'd write to her and say, hey, writing the song about you. She'd say, I'd love to hear it. Oh my gosh, I'm so flattered. And then finally it was finished and she heard it. And she, I hadn't seen her in probably 10 years. And she showed up to that gig that we played at the Warfield. That was the first time I'd seen her. And I got to sing Gina on stage at the Warfield for Gina. And she showed up as a reporter, a music writer, she was doing a report on me for the magazine that she works for now. How freaking cool. And she's totally out of Vegas. She lives in San Francisco. She's, you know, she just got married. It's all happening for her. She went up instead of down. It's, it's really, really cool. And it's a true story. <laughs> I love it. All the most of the good ones, not all of them, but most of the good ones are true stories. You know, I mean, yeah. And and the thing about it is, is that you know, I'm I'm drawn to to people with colorful pasts. Yeah, me too. They're the best. I love a good story, man. You know, like we just went hunting a couple. Of, well, about last week it was, and we met one of the biggest characters I've we've ever met ever. But if he's listening to the podcast, give a shout out to. Uh, to uncle rob but yeah you just man you meet people along the way and it's like dude you got to write a song about that person you know it, it's uh i don't know it's just powerful that, that song's always been powerful now let's talk about this man our good friend ward davis yeah uh who we talked last night until about one o'clock in the morning uh we were having one of those late night i'd been drinking some cold beer and he got on the whiskey pretty good and uh it was one of it was one of those conversations, but um, Ward's Ward's doing good. But he just dropped a new record, and uh, you and him have a hell of a song on there called Threads. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you went out there. When did y'all write that? I think we wrote that in eight eighteen. Yeah. Well, no. Uh... Did I go, uh, that was, I went out there, I think in like February, uh, a February. And then was it that following August that Scott and Rev and I came to visit you? I can't yeah, I remember so. anything yeah. anymore. Right. But yeah, I did go out there. I went out to his little cabin 
and we spent a few days writing that song. He mentioned it a little bit in the press that it was kind of a tumultuous time for him and and it was something that he needed to express and write about. So when that first day we got together, he made me some cornbread and some stew and um, we sat in his cabin and talked for like hours. And then it sort of started to come together organically, which is what you hope for. And I had this concept from an, a song that I wrote called Down to Threads, which didn't quite coalesce for me and it didn't make it on my last album, but I loved that concept so much. Like I am down to threads. I am threadbare. Uh, you know, you can see through me if I turn to the sun, like I'm down, I'm down to threads. And, and I told Ward my idea for that concept and he went threads. I don't think we started writing on it that night. I went back to my hotel and then I came back in the morning and he's like, what do you think of this? And he played this beautiful melody and he, he just went another day. And I said, same old hell. And I said, um, I feel like we're like just digging down into like a dried up well. And we were like, that rhymes. <laughs> and it just started. Going. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's the subconscious works in incredible, amazing ways. Um, it, I just love songwriting so much and it's, it's, I'm just so thankful. It's such a treasure that it, that I, you know, that it works so well with Ward and it's beautiful what they did with it on the record and the, the studio production and all the instruments that they added in. And, um, I think people, people are really loving it, which is fantastic. Oh, it's my yeah. mom's favorite song on that record. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, I was talking to her the other, I went down the other day for, for Thanksgiving and we were talking about it because mom loves Ward. My mom texts Ward like he's her child as well. And it, so she was, we were talking about his record and she's listened to it and she was like, I just love threads. I just, oh, I just love threads so much. I, was like, mom, I love it's that a, song. It's a great song. You know, you know, I have a thing for horribly miserable love songs. I just, <laughs> I love them. I think yeah. they're beautiful. Heartbreak is beautiful to me you know yeah that's man that's a such a interesting way to look at it but you know that's uh, that's a tidy title of your record you know heartbreak and canyon revelry and that i don't know it's such a but yeah talking about threads man and 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 you know it was an honor for me to to be a, a part of that record as well you know we um i don't know it's just fun you know to yeah. See to see somebody cut something that you know y'all worked on together, and you and I've worked on a couple, and we just uh, finally figured out how to do this writing uh, over Zoom and over phone calls and texts and stuff like that. But it works. Another thing I hadn't done before, but it, I think it really works. I I was just playing that uh, newest one that we wrote, just to listen. To Scott and I just listened to it, and I, dude. The, the recording that you sent to me, the late night one, like, how's this? And you're trying to be all quiet. I was trying to be quiet, yeah. <laughs> trying to be quiet. And you're like, man, I'm stoned. You know, <laughs> the way it's so perfect. You have to put that as it is on like a special limited edition thing just so people can hear that because it's so beautiful like that it's but, so raw just you and your guitar and you're just you're just so in the moment i love it that's a great song well i think no thank you for for helping me write it and i i i had written some up some parts of it and for some reason man i just like because the the way that i i write now you know it's like if i don't finish one by myself i think like who's the right person to help me finish this song and and I called you and it's like, bam, 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 bam. You know, we got it down. But that was one of those songs that I kept, I kept waking up with that one in my head, like morning after morning after morning. It just, it was stuck in there. 
And uh, man, I'm, I'm glad we finally got to button it up, you know? It's so good. And the one that we wrote before that is great too. It is, man. After we, uh, after I got so, man, and this, this is funny. Pearl got to see me get frustrated when we were writing our first song together. You know, I, I got so frustrated because we were sitting there and we're like, does this sound like another, another song? Oh, that was funny. <laughs> And, and I was like, yes, yeah, it sounds like one of my damn songs. I'm like, <laughs> we were playing it back in the kitchen. You were playing it back in the kitchen and I was sitting at the table with you and Rebecca was in the kitchen and she's listening and I see her going like this. She's like doing something. She's going, and then you finished and I went and you're like, yeah, it sounds great. And I said, is that, I'm not the devil. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we can't we can't get away from Ward Davis, but yeah, we're yeah. <laughs> we're like shit, damn it! But it was it was it was cool. It it didn't need to be so dr- like drastically altered. It it would just we, we just changed it from a waltz back to a yeah, chord. back to a little more straight. But you know, it's funny though because really you can't steal from yourself. Like what you know, there's really you know, it's like. So Pearl, you know, you've you've been doing music for a really really long time. I think you started in in your dad's band singing with him since 96. But ha- have you always written d- during that time or is writing something you started doing later on in 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 your career? I always wrote since I was a teenager, but I don't I never had the confidence to show it to anybody. It I didn't really come into myself i think as as a performer performer until well into those nine years that i was traveling and singing with my dad um on the road well i I joined him when i was 18 i think 19 maybe it's whenever bat 2 came out which was early 90s yeah, I was 19. I was a freshman in college and my dad said, uh, listen, we got the, the new, the new, the new album is out. Bat 2 is out. It's a huge hit. Um, we're going to do a world tour. You are a singer. You're a great singer. Would you want to audition to be in my touring band? And I said, yes. <laughs> Um, because I'd traveled with him my whole life. I, I grew up on a tour bus. My family would always travel with dad all over the world. Um, so I, I knew that life. I liked, I liked that life. I like being in a different place every other day. I guess maybe because it's just what I became used to. I like, it's exciting to me. I like forward movement. And so I said, yes, I do. I want to audition. Uh, he said, okay. I'm playing Madison Square Garden. <laughs> okay. We're going to put you, we're going to fly. Cause I was in Boston. I started uh, Emerson college in Boston and he said, we're going to fly you to New York. We're going to put you on the side of the stage with a live mic. No one will see you and no one will hear you, but George at front of house is going to record you. And I'm going to listen after the show. So here, take this CD and learn all the harmonies as best as you can. And we're going to go. So, you know, I knew the older stuff because I grew up with it. Um, so I, I really had to learn the new songs that he was playing, the Anything for Love, um, songs like that. And so I did it. And I, I learned it as well as I could. And then I st- stood on the side of the stage and I was t- terrified but um i passed and i got the job so then i became part of the band and my dad said to me uh so listen of course i'm your dad all the time but when you're on my stage when you're on my bus when you're on my tour you're my employee so i expect for you to act like an employee show up when you're supposed to show up do your job and i said no problem and uh you know, I had always watched him perform my whole life, but being a part of the show and watching him from the stage and having to learn cues. My dad's very dramatic. It's very theatrical. So there are lots of cues with videos and pyro and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was a really quick education 
because I hadn't done, I hadn't been a part of any production like that up to that point. I had done, you know, college theater and high school theater and I uh, had a band, you know, but like a high school band, things like that. And I learned a lot. And I traveled with him for nine years. We went to Middle East. We went all over the US, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. We even went down to Tasmania. Wow. Below Australia, Africa. It was wild. And yes, obviously one of the best times of my life. And I learned a lot. So I'm extremely grateful for that. I like the fact that you like, tried out for your dad's band and yeah in the, in the process of like standing on the side of the stage i'm going to go back and listen to these tape listen to it later mm-hmm. you know man i love yeah, because that. because don't fuck up my show absolutely i mean like because i can i can agree with the i'm your dad all the time but the when you're on my stage when you're on my bus you're an employee and I expect you to act like that. And yeah. man, I, I love that. I'm mean, like, that is, <laughs> you take all the nepotism out of that, that scenario. I appreciate, I mean, how could you not appreciate that? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want license to come around here and, and be a shithead. I don't want to be that person. I, mm-hmm. I want to be upstanding and I want to do my job right. And I want to learn how to do it right so that I can go on doing the right job for other people in the future and hopefully later for myself. If I'm just a slacker, what, what am I going to do with that? You know what I mean? So he, he should have done what he did. I'm glad that he did, you know? Well, and, and I've always appreciated, you know, getting to know you and, and, and know your story that, you know, you haven't used that as, Hey, l-, you know, Look who my dad is. You, you've never once said, I mean, when we first started this podcast, you said, my dad, oh yeah, he's, he's a musician. You didn't even say his name. And, and I just think that speaks very highly of, of your character and, oh. and, uh, you, you know, the, the way you've gone about it. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. But, you know, let's, let's talk about a little further into your journey. Um, I saw you back in 2000 and didn't even realize, uh, you know, that I had seen you. Um, and you were singing with Motley Crue. Did I know that? Did I know that you came to one of those, sh- the Maximum no, Rock no, Tour? No, 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 You didn't know me back. This was, this was, uh, no, Monsters but I are- mean, since, since I know you, I, I don't know if I'm, oh, maybe you told me that. You must have told me that. I don't yeah. Know. I, I think we probably, had, I, I'm, I, hell, I don't know. I've smoked a lot of pot since we've toured together, but the, <laughs> the, the, the Monsters of Rock Tour, it was, um, no, no, Maximum Rock. Maximum Rock. Yes, I'm sorry. Maximum Rock Tour. Um, I think I still have that T-shirt. It, it was uh, it was Anthrax, Megadeth, Motley Crue, and you were singing with Crue, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Like, how long did you sing with them? I mean, and and I'm not asking for crazy Motley Crue road stories or whatever, but but like, I don't know what you're talking about. How? But how how was that that experience? It was kick ass. That was also one of the best times of my life, obviously, for obvious reasons. I sang with them for just that tour. Mm -hmm. It started in June of 2000, and we did all of the states, and we ended in September. And then we took October off, and then we went and we did a month in Japan, uh, the month of November 2000. And that was it. And then a couple years after that, actually, uh, Nikki hired me to join his band 6AM, And so, uh, I was in 6am for like six months, I think. And then they, they changed things around, but I had a blast. I auditioned for that too. And when I auditioned, it was deep in the Valley at this big warehouse place. And Tommy wasn't in the band then. Tommy Lee was not in the band then. It was Randy Castillo who was playing drums. So when I auditioned, I auditioned for uh, Nikki, Randy Castillo, Mick Mars, and Vince was supposed to be there that day, but he had a court date. Um, <laughs> uh, of <so> course. <laughs> um, you know, that was like, I think I maybe peed my pants a little bit that day. Um, it was two days auditioning, 
But this, for me, Motley Crue was my ultimate, uh, uh, like, teenage, forget about it. I used to save up all my allowance to buy Metal Edge magazine and circus, and uh, and I cut out tiny little pictures of Nikki Six and paste them on my wall, uh, and Tommy Lee, you know, uh, and I knew every word to every song, every album, and so that that actually made me feel really confident for the audition because I walked in there and I was like, I got this, and I, you know, I tried to tart it up a little bit, uh, you know, because I I had gone, my dad took me to see Motley Crue a couple times but i remember going to meadowlands i think it's in new jersey i think meadowlands new jersey yeah Um, yeah, but yeah yeah, it was when uh when he when motley still had the the nasty habits you know donna and amy the two blonde singers Mm -hmm. and i remember just because i used to just watch that and just cry and watch uh mtv and (laughs) what's up dude (laughs) um Sorry, guys. Revel brought me this beautiful bowl of stuff. Oh, wow. What do you got in there, Rev? Um, food coloring. Well, I put a bunch of food coloring. It was just a bunch of colors. Then I put dish soap in it, and it all spread out like that. That's awesome. really cool. Look at that. Is that yes. dish soap so, and food coloring and milk? Mm-hmm. So this is today's mm. science experiment? Drink some. <laughs> yeah, have it. Tell it. Have, <laughs> this hey, is... Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. What is it? I was just gonna say, yeah. Okay, this is beautiful. That looks cool. We man. just got done doing a homemade uh, lava lamp. So hook, hit me up after this, and we'll, I'll give you that <laughs> recipe. Cool. We'll, we'll talk homeschool science uh, science experiments. <laughs> Ruby, baby, that's beautiful, baby. So we save that on the counter, and we'll take a picture. Yep. Okay. Nice job. I hope this all stays in. Oh no, we're not editing any of that. That's <laughs> that, <laughs> that's too good, man. Um, I forgot where I was. You're saying about the girls' the bad habits? They were they would just cry, like watching. Oh no, no the nasty no. habits. Yeah. I would cry watching them because oh. I was like, I love you so much. Um, and all my other all my other girlfriends, teenager girlfriends, were into like new kids on the block, and I was like, <laughs> you know, it's all about Motley Crue and Aerosmith, and anyway, um. So yeah, I went in the first day and I, I auditioned and I sang my girls, girls, girls as best as I could. And uh, I forget which other songs I sang. And then they sent me back out into the, you know, the cattle call of chicks. And it wasn't the assistant person that came out. It was actually Nikki himself who came out. And out of the crowd of chicks, Nikki was like, Pearl, Pearl, come here. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, and I walked in there and he goes, he goes, okay, come sit down. And they sat down next to him on the couch and Mick is there. And, and they said, okay, we know we, you're in, we know you, we, we know with that we want you. Um, will you help us pick the other chick? <laughs> and I said, oh, wow. Yes, I would love to, because you know, how cool is that? I, I, I have to be on tour with this person too. And I've been out there for a couple hours meeting people and stuff. So I named this, uh, this girl who I kind of connected with and, and, uh, she got, she got the job. And then we, we started rehearsals down at the Olympia downtown. I don't think it's a venue anymore. It was an old famous venue in downtown LA. And I think we did three weeks or a mu- uh, yeah, three weeks, a month of rehearsals and, uh, costume purchasing on Hollywood Boulevard, um, you know, uh, pyro rehearsals, lyrics, and then, you know, Vince, Vince was there with us. And, um, actually Randy Castillo was the drummer. He got, he, he fell really ill. He got very sick. And so, um, Samantha Maloney from Hole took over and she wound up doing the tour with us. Yeah. She, she was playing drums whenever, um, whenever I saw you guys in Dallas. Yeah, she wound up doing the whole tour because Randy suddenly got very ill and Randy actually passed not that long after that. So that was a really big deal. Um, yeah. But very tragic and sad. But um, uh, Samantha, I think, did a great job. Oh, and she was awesome. She, she was awesome. Yeah. She had that fan that was blowing her hair back and she was like... <laughs> 
you know? Oh yeah. She's a beast, man. Uh, it, was, yeah. it was, it was fun to watch her play. And it was cool to see a woman in that position in Motley Crue and not, you know, the booby girls are, are, you got, you can't have heavy metal rock and roll without booby girls. Come on. But <laughs> very yeah. important. But to see her wailing away on the drums was so cool. And she had such a cool feel and we became really great friends. It was, it was one hell of a time. It was really, really cool. Yeah. Very fun. Do you awesome. still ever keep in touch with a girl that got the job with you, the singer? No, actually, Mar Marty, her name is Marty. She, uh, she's in Texas. She lives in Texas. Oh. I think I forget where she, I think she got married. She had some babies and, uh, yeah, but she was fun. I got pictures. I can't show them to you, but I got them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pearl, what, what was that transition like from, you know, doing that backup, you know, cause I sing backup with Cody. Uh, and the thought of me going like, all right, I'm going to go be a front man would just, uh, you know, it, it, it's a completely different world. You know, I'm sure that was kind of a, a, quite the mental thing to, you know, get out there and be confident being in the spotlight all the time. It is hard. It, it it's hard to, to front a band. It's hard. You have to, it's a, there's, cause there's a science to it. You have to understand how to navigate an audience, right, Cody? I mean, you have to know. I, you had me at being a front man is hard. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's, it's a hard job. Yeah, it's a it's a hard job um, because you re you have to go out there in charge. That's another thing my dad said to me uh, growing up. He said your audience wants for you to lead them. They're looking to you. They come to see you. They want for you to send them on a journey. They want to escape. They want to feel it. And they want for you to show them the way. That's what they're there for. And you cannot let them down. And you can't, even if you're nervous, it doesn't matter. Guess what? Nervousness doesn't exist when you're a front man. Ain't nobody got time for that. Right? Yeah. You, yeah. That, because once your audience sees you show your nerves, then you're toast. Yeah. It's sort of a, this mob mentality type of thing where I don't know if they even mean to or want to, and not every audience is like that, but you know, once they feel like you're letting them down, it's hard to get that back. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, so that was a tough transition for me. The decision for me to decide to go and try to do my own thing was a big one, obviously. At the time, I had, you know, the band In Excess. Mm -hmm. um, their people called and asked me to audition for their new touring band because they had, they remember they had that show and that guy, J.D. Fortune or, was his name, and he won a spot to be the lead singer of In Excess. I don't know if you remember this. I remember that anyway, show, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock star, Supernova or something. Yeah. And um, so they were going on tour and they needed a backup singer and um, so I went to a hotel on Sunset Boulevard and auditioned for the band, the brothers and the whole band in a hotel room. I had to learn, I had to sing lead. I had to sing Michael Hutchins part, yeah. <laughs> which was a trip. And they didn't really change the key for me either. And he kind of said, <laughs> so I did my best and I got the job anyway. And they, you know, they said, you got the job we're going to start this time. We're going to start this time. And underneath and behind that, I had been talking to this producer who owned Cherokee studios on Fairfax Boulevard. Scott introduced me to him and I have been writing my own songs and doing all that type of stuff. And I thought, you know, oh, I don't know if I want to keep being a backup singer. Maybe I should not that that's a bad thing. That is a great thing. Um, and it works really well for a lot of people. You can make a lot of money doing that if you get with the right act, you know. But I thought, shit, if I'm going to try and do this, I better try and do this now. You know, I'm not getting any younger. I don't want to hide behind. I'm scared or I'm not ready or anything like that. I, it felt like it was the time for me to try it. 
So I told in excess, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And then I went ahead and I made my first demo and then played every club in Los Angeles. Um, the Roxy, the Viper Room, the Whiskey Go Go. At the time, it was, uh, there was another place called the Key Club, which famously used to be Gazari's back in the day. And now it's called One Oak or something. Blah, blah, blah. All of those places and had a full band. I actually, when I started, I had a horn section. <laughs> oh, wow. I had a horn section. I had four horn players and a B3 on stage. So that was fun moving around. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. We know how that is. <laughs> and, you know, two guitars, bass, drums, um, that was fun trying to fit all that on the you had all of it. Stamp yeah. stage of the Viper Room. Yeah. Um, but because the Viper yeah, Room is then, just so big, you know. Yes, yeah, spacious. Yeah. So so spacious. <laughs> and then uh, not long after that, um, you know, we had sent my little immaculate white fox album. We sent it to Slash for him to listen to, and he listened to it. And he hired us to open for Velvet Revolver in the UK. It was their last UK tour. I was glad that I said no to In Excess. <laughs> I, I was, you know, started climbing that ladder when I did. And I, and I got to do what I got to do. So it worked out. It worked out at the time, yeah. I think it worked out overall. I think you're just fine, yeah. <laughs> And then I got to share the stage with Cody Jinx. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't know how cool that is, but it's something, right? It's, you know what? You guys and Ward are just a gift to me, knowing you guys, because we met at Earl's house mm -hmm. over Mexican food and tequila and singing songs in the living room. And then you're like, do you want to come and sing a song with me at the Troubadour? Yeah, we were there. We were playing the Troubadour that next night. Uh, I, you might know this now, but the Troubadour is one of my most favorite special sacred venues on the planet. It's a special place. It's a really special place. Yeah. I mean, that's where Elton John started. It's where a lot of people started. Where looking, a lot of like, people started. Looking at the walls there. Famously, I mean, Elton John's story is very famous regarding the Troubadour. I don't know. It just, that place is like church to me. Yeah. And so for you to invite me to come sing with you was like everything to me. Well, so it, well, <laughs> no, and we it, sang Pink Floyd, which was on, you know, the cherry on top. It was well, and, and, and I know that you had, you, you knew that song and we had just cut that song and released it, um, mm -hmm. at that point. And, um, and yeah, we, we were just talking that night before and it was like, yeah, man, just come out and cause what I was doing was, I was like, it basically like come out and sing with me. Cause I'd already, the wheels had started turning like, you know, we might tour together, that type of thing. So yeah, you came out man and sang with me. And the last time we got to sing that song together was in LA in January, right before everything shut down. Yeah. I was going to say, of course I know I wish you were here, Pink Floyd. Everybody should know that. And if you don't, you should go learn it. I knew that song very well as a duet because I had I had always done that with Jerry Cantrell at the Dime Bash events, mm -hmm. which were in memory and in honor of our brother Dimebag Daryl. You happen to be a lifelong fan of Daryl and Pantera and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just so happy that you got to connect with Rita and that you got to come out in January, last January, before the lockdown. Yeah. Um, yeah. And instead of me and Jerry doing it, it was me and Cody doing it. I got to tell you, that was, I've done a bunch of really cool stuff and music has afforded me a lot of really neat opportunities to meet a lot of really neat and cool people. Getting invited to play at Dime Bash was, that's, <laughs> I mean, like everybody knows I have a, a, a heavy metal uh, background and, and, uh, all that, all that stuff. That's no, that's no big secret. That was one of the damn coolest things that I have, I have ever got to be a part of. Mm -hmm. I'm not it joking. It was very cool. And yeah. you did the David Allen Coe song too. Yeah. We did the rebel meets rebel song. Uh, nothing to lose. Um, 
and and there's a lot of damn words in that song, man. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I, rehear, I, I rehearsed that song so hard for like two weeks, man. I was so nervous. I was like, that's funny. A, a you walk killed in, it. You dude, killed walk it. in, do it, do wearing a cowboy hat. Look, like, <laughs> who the hell is that this guy? Perfect. You can, yeah. No, no. Are you kidding me? Rita wears a cowboy hat every single day of her life. Oh man, I'm gonna have to get Rita on the show. I. I had reached out to you last year uh, at some point to see if I could get her information to, to talk with her because I had met her, met her a long, 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 long time ago. And then I'd met her through you guys as well at that get together. You know, I just had to share a story with her about Dime and it went real deep and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it doesn't matter, but she's, yeah, she's lovely, but it was so, it was so nice. She, so nice to be a part of that. She loves you. She wrote to me after you spoke to her. She didn't tell me what your story was or anything, but she said, thank you for connecting me with Cody. He is a sweetheart. Uh, yeah. It was, it was pretty deep, man. There were, there were, <laughs> there were tears involved, man. As, Good. Uh, yeah. But, but, um, golly, man, we could sit here and, and BS for hours. Um, well, listen, you never asked me what I was drinking. You told I me um, I, I was required I, to day drink. And well, yeah, I dude, did. I scrambled. I thought that this was at 2 p.m. my time, L.A., and you wrote to me at noon going, you're ready? And I was like, <laughs> And so literally in three minutes, I changed my clothes, put on mascara, set up this beautiful ring light. Do you, did you notice? I have one. I'm so well lit. You have to have one. You I have, have a it. ring light. Yes, absolutely. I do. Um, set up, rigged up this whole thing, pour myself a drink. So, so what are you drinking? Whiskey. Are you, oh, you're a couple in what, what kind of whiskey you got in there? Hill rock. Okay. Hill That's rock whiskey. It's, um, actually it's the new, uh, anthrax. Is it the, uh, yes. And, uh, uh, Scott, uh, now I actually brought that up to my manager the other day about us getting, uh, getting with them. I think that is a fun idea. They do anthrax and they do a motorhead whiskey as well. And they want to do a Cody Jinx whiskey. Yeah, I know. That's, and that's, that's what, yeah, I need to give them a holler. I think that sounds like so much fun. I, you know, I, they're, they're the whiskey. Wonderful. Yeah, and yeah. they're the only uh, one, I think one of, if not, uh, no, I think they're the only uh, distillery in the United States who still does it totally old school, like um, malt, they, they spread out the malt on the floor and they let it dry, they soak it. What are you guys laughing about? I told him, Bob Keith is Sorry. cracking up. Keith, Keith said must be the whiskey and they dumbasses, both of them got tickled. Sorry. Oh, he hadn't said anything the whole time, and then he busts out with that and got me. <laughs> oh Lord! I'm sitting sorry, here trying I'm to sorry. listen to Pearl's story. Two jack wagons are over there laughing about a song quote. I'm just jabbering. I didn't even notice until I looked. Uh, no, I'm and so Josh sorry, is Pearl. like Josh is I'm like sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it must be it must be the whiskey. I don't know. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need to give. I need to get in touch with them because uh, uh, it was something like y'all were out there and and were they playing one of my songs in the in the distillery or something? We stayed there uh, for almost two weeks. They have this. Uh, you got to someday. You'll get up there and you'll see it. They have this beautiful house up on a hill above the distillery, and they have a guest house. And they they invited us to stay in the guest house for a little bit over a week. And um, every Every day at about five o'clock, we would head over to the main house and Jeffrey, it's Jeffrey and Kathy who own the distillery and the company. Jeffrey starts, he, he pours some, some drinks and he starts cooking dinner and they put on a playlist and every playlist they put on, there were like 52 Cody songs on it. <laughs> so we, and it was awesome. And so we'd be, Scott and I'd be like, because Scott and I both cook too, and we'd be at the counter helping and chopping carrots or something and go, that's Cody. <laughs> that's Cody. Can you, you're just singing at us from every direction. That's awesome. That's yeah. Probably, so that's we cool. told them, we were like, this is Cody. They were like, we love Cody Jinx. He's, he's so great. And I said, well, you should do whiskey with him. They're interested. So get oh, on that. 
I know, I know. I just, what the hell else have I got going on, right? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> hey, we're right. drinking. You got that. that. Ain't no damn joke. I, hell, I'm on beer number three right here. Oh, I need to get some more of that dead gum. Uh, the anthrax. Uh, War dance. That's, yeah, that's good beer, man. It's really good. You guys sent me like a shit ton of them, and I I drink every damn one of them. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Why would you be, Pearl? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you've seen me drink beer, so. I think we sent you three cases or something. And I drink them all. I drink every damn one of them. But, well, that's um, what they're for. That's what they're for. I mean, you know, it's like, I, dude, the other day, it's, it's cool, man. We had we had Steve Austin on the show a couple weeks ago. And after the show, he sent me some of his beer, too. And I drink every damn one of those. <laughs> You're winning. I'm, I'm with y'all just keep sending me beer, man. I'm like, I'm, I'm working from home now. I don't even have to drive anywhere. <laughs> That's it. You're done. Golly. All right, Pearl. This is, um, this is a part of the show where we call it. Why do I know this? And it's a, uh, it's a Q and a, and it's, it's basically just a rapid fire from, from Josh and Bobby Keith. Are you ready? Okay. Bobby Keith, go ahead. I'm yeah. A favorite two AM meal. Macaroni and cheese. A morning person or a night owl? Night owl. And your favorite video game growing up or present if you play them? Oh crap. What was the one I think it was an Atari game? Well, Mario Brothers. Obviously, but yeah. before that, there was the one where it would drop that bomb on the little levels that were moving. I'm older than you; you won't know that. Well, oh. I remember the Atari. I remember yeah, Atari. I remember that. I remember that. There remember was that. the one. It was like this guy at top who would drop a, like a little round bomb, and it would hit levels on the bottom that were anyway. That's Mario Brothers. Ram. Yeah, Mario. Okay, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> Pearl, do you believe in ghosts? Yeah. Have you seen one? Yeah, there's a story behind that. Yeah, but uh, in a room where I was, where somebody somebody took a video and then played it back for us in this special way where you could see it plainly, but then you could really see it. It was wild. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Have, you ever, uh, have you ever run a car out of a gas? While you're no, driving. no, no. Nice. I haven't either. Yeah. Uh, Knock on wood. <laughs> I'm surprised at all the people that say no, they've never run a car out of gas. How Why? have you never run a car out of gas? Because you look all. to see they have a, they if have there's a gauge. gas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there's I mean, a like... gauge that if it gets down to that letter that's called E, yeah. you fill it before it gets there. Yeah. Well, sometimes I've had cars that the gas gauge didn't work. Well, <laughs> but but all the times that I ran out, I think the gas gauge was working fine. I, yeah, I just saying. I was just yeah. like, oh, I can make it. I, yeah, I always think, man, I can, I can make it another. That what's the next stop, man? I I got it. I ran out of gas like as recent as like two years ago, man. Me and Rebecca and the kids were pulling the camper. <laughs> we were. I'm not joking, man. We were driving down. I don't know why I went off on this stoner tangent, but we were. <laughs> We were driving down to, we were halfway in between uh, Corpus Christi and uh, uh, San Antonio, and there's not a whole lot of gas stations in that stretch. And uh, I was pulling the trailer, and I wasn't getting as good a gas mileage as I thought. It ran out of gas, and it just, yeah. Bummer. Anyway, I'm glad you haven't, though, Pearl. I will continue not to. Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> that, that means you have your shit together, Pearl. That's what that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, uh, so if you went on the David Letterman show, what would your stupid human trick be if you you went on for that segment? Got any of those? I have been on the David Letterman show. For stupid human tricks? No. Oh, okay. No. I can wiggle my ears. Can you really? You want to see? Yeah. Yeah. I'd All right. See let's that, see yeah. if we can if we can make it happen. All right. All right. Okay. Ready? All right. So. Oh my goodness! Oh yeah, there they go. yeah. That, that, that's that's legit. not even like kind of that. That yeah, is, it's like you're flexing them. It's like going. <laughs> it's crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Love it. Thank you, Pearl. Pearl, you're the best. Um, 
first of all, thank you for being like we're golden girls. Thank you for being a friend. Uh, you you guys have definitely become good friends of ours, and uh, we value that, and we love you very much, and we love your family, and uh, all that good stuff. So just we appreciate you being on this show, man. Thank you for having me, man. And all of that stuff back to you. Just one last thing. We were looking at photos from last year in Disneyland. And I love the fact that you got to be in Disneyland in Star Wars world, but hadn't seen any of the Star Wars yet. And then you all went home and watched all the Star Wars. All of them. But, a, but you I'm were a- standing right in front of the Millennium Falcon. And I didn't know and what you were it was. like, this is cool, but I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. Scott and I are like crying nerd tears. It's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, and we did. It was so much fun. You know, we, we got to go out there and, and uh, you know, it was it was me and Larson and Scott and Revel. Uh, we got to be the flyers and the gunners on the, the Millennium Falcon ride. And I was like, man, this is really fun. And and at that point, you know, I was 39 and I, it was kind of almost like a badge of honor. Like I hadn't seen a Star Wars. I didn't have anything against it. It was like, I mean, I've made it this long, you know, whatever. We did that. Went on that trip with you guys. And then I get home and it's like, order them all. It's like, we got to get all these. And we, it, as, a, as a family, we sat down and watched every single one of them. Now my son watches them all the time. I can tell you which one my favorite is now. All the characters. It's funny, man. Because they're the best. Oh, they're great. They're they're absolutely great, man. It's good guys and bad guys, and it's a you know a space western and pew pew shoot 'em up and you know. Welcome to the world, Cody Jenks. I I just found it, man. I've been here for about a year now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's cool, man. Well, hey, uh, we'll go ahead and close this one out. This is uh, uh, season two, episode four. Um, our guest today is Pearl. Thank you so much, Pearl. Thank you, uh, Bobby Keith, coming out of Waco, Texas. Josh Thompson, coming out of Boyd, Texas. Seth Knows Noseworthy, coming out of Nashville, Tennessee. And the ever lovely and just one of the most awesome human beings ever in the whole wide world that I've ever met, Miss Pearl Aday. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Keith. It's so good to see your faces. I really yes, appreciate it. You I love that you invited me. Thank I you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Yes, for sure. When we can start playing again. All right, guys. This is uh, this is another episode of A Couple In with Cody Jinks, and uh, we appreciate you guys listening, and we'll see you all next time. <laughs>